thank you, Kate, for that uh, kind introduction. I appreciate it. Yes, I'm Remington Nevin. Uh, I was a military physician for uh, 14 years before I matriculated here uh, last summer. And during that time, I, I became interested in this drug. Uh, mefloquine, or larium, was developed by the U.S. military uh, in a drug discovery program that lasted throughout the 60s and into the 1970s. And you're probably familiar with it. If you haven't traveled overseas and taken it, you're probably familiar with it from all of the media reports that have occurred you know, over the last few years. And I have some screenshots captured here. It's a very controversial medication. And there's a lot of uncertainty and, I would say, misinformation uh, surrounding its psychotropic or, or mental health effects. So I hope to clear up some of that information today based on the research that I did in the Army and that I will continue as a, as a student here. So to understand why I consider this a psychotropic medication, really all you have to do is look at the original product insert from 1989 when the drug was, was first licensed. It lists a number of very disturbing neuropsychiatric symptoms which don't seem to belong in a drug that targets a malaria parasite. Here you have uh, the warning that if unexplained anxiety, depression, restlessness, or confusion are noticed, these may be considered prodromal to a more serious event, and in these cases, the drug must be discontinued. The product warns of cases of encephalopathy having been linked to the drug, and also central nervous system disturbances, including hallucinations, confusion, confusion anxiety, and depression. So, so not a benign medication. The reason I claim this is a psychotropic medication with only incidental antimalarial properties is as follows. If someone is going to experience psychotropic effects, these are likely to occur within the first few doses, within the first one to four doses. Rather. The product manufacturer admits as much. But because the drug is dosed weekly and it's highly lipid soluble, it takes up to seven to ten weeks to build up in blood to levels that adequately suppress the malaria parasite. So many who take this drug on short vacations return home having experienced psychotropic effects from the drug, but before they ever experienced reliable suppressive activity from the drug. Hence, it's not acting as an antimalarial, it's acting primarily as a psychotropic drug, causing symptoms such as, at the very least, vivid dreams. Now only about one to two percent of every ingested tablet the drug contained there is ultimately found at the site of its intended action in the serum. Because it's so lipophilic, it goes into the tissues, including the brain. And by these simple calculations based on autopsy reports and animal studies, it concentrates about twice as high in the brain as it does in serum. So what I would contend is that the neuropsychiatric side effects that are described in the literature and in the product insert, think of these not as side effects, but as symptoms of a highly conserved syndrome of intoxication. What are the symptoms of mefloquine intoxication? Well, again, you just have to look at the product insert. Anxiety, depression, restlessness, or confusion. These are considered prodromal to a, quote, more serious event. Now, unfortunately, someone suffering from mefloquine intoxication might have these symptoms confused for other conditions, including DSM conditions. One I'll talk about briefly is post-traumatic stress disorder. There's a lot of overlap between the symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder and the symptoms of mefloquine intoxication but a number of other DSM conditions as well. The drug also has subclinical effects, including things as mild as personality change. Now, this will never get you a clinical diagnosis, but many individuals, having taken the drug, report feeling as though their personality or character has been permanently altered as a result of their taking the drug. So there's a very large potential subclinical effect of this drug. And as a result, I consider uh, the potential public mental health impact of this intoxication syndrome to be underappreciated, affecting a number of groups, predominantly military personnel and veterans, international travelers, and also, and this is interesting, and I've thought more about this um, since my time here, residents of low and middle income countries and residents of conflict zones who have been given this drug uh, to prevent or treat malaria. Tens of millions of people have been exposed to the drug, and I would guess that millions of those have suffered some degree of intoxicating symptoms from this drug. What is this more serious event, though, that the drug product insert refers to? This, this is a euphemism, right? A more serious event could mean lots of things. But I suspect what it means is psychosis, risk of impulsive violence and suicide, and neurotoxicity. And the literature is full of reports of, of these events linked to the drug. Here's a particularly uh, disturbing uh, suicide 
that features uh, signs of delusions and persecutions. You see religious themes, a cross carved into the, uh, the arm of uh, the deceased, and, and uh, he died from multiple stab wounds, which is a very unusual way to die. Uh, most people don't, can't do that. Um, and, and also the drug has been shown to be neurotoxic. It actually causes visible lesions in animal models in uh, the brainstem. Uh, and this was shown by a military researcher some years ago. So the drug, these more serious events that are being referred to um, are, are, are quite profound. They're, they're, they're quite serious. Uh, a paper came out recently uh, commenting on drugs that have been linked in, in adverse event reports to acts of violence. And, and, and if, if you look at the, the list of drugs here, you see one of these is not like the others. These are all psychotropic drugs or, or known psychotropic drugs. And here you have mefloquine right in the middle. So again, more evidence that mefloquine is actually a psychotropic drug with incidental antimalarial properties. Um, let me play a video, uh, and you can get a feel for how the public uh, perceives this issue. Images of what Canadian soldiers saw in Afghanistan over a decade at war. Some of them came home with permanent scars, and now they're wondering if those scars were preventable. The Canadian forces gave them a drug to fight malaria that they're now finding out may have caused long-term damage to their brains. The CBC's Nancy Wood now with the side effects of war. Donald Hookie has been home for six years now, but Afghanistan still haunts him. Until recently, Hookie blamed his rage and nightmares on post-traumatic stress disorder. But now, he wonders if an anti-malaria drug given to him by the Canadian Army played a role. It really freaks me out reading what I've been reading on the, on the side effects of the drugs. Mefloquin, also called larium, is one of three drugs prescribed to prevent malaria in Canadian troops in Afghanistan and some African nations. But research now shows that in some people, it can build to toxic levels and possibly cause permanent brain damage that mimics PTSD or head injuries. In 2009, the U.S. military issued a warning about it, saying even though most soldiers tolerate it well, mefloquine can cause psychotic behavior and should not be routinely prescribed. CBC News has learned that the Canadian Forces has not updated its policy in years and continues to offer mefloquine as an option to its soldiers. Dr. Remington Nevin has been studying the effects of mefloquine. The very worst case scenario is that a soldier that suffers toxicity from mefloquine is left with permanent brainstem injury. The drug dates back to the Vietnam War, a time when the U.S. Army was losing soldiers daily to malaria. Army scientists searched for new drugs to fight the mosquito-borne disease. From the start, soldiers reported disturbing side effects with mefloquine, vivid nightmares, hallucinations, even psychosis. The drug companies have always warned of having side effects and told travelers to switch to another drug if it happens. These could be an indication, an early warning sign of a developing more serious brain condition, a toxicity caused by rising levels of the drug. For the first time, the U.S. Centers for Disease Control's Yellow Book Traveler Advisory this year issued a warning about mefloquine, saying it should not be used for military deployments because those side effects can easily be confused with PTSD or brain injury. Mefloquine is still available in the U.S. and Canada, where Health Canada says it's effective and generally well tolerated. We showed Dr. Nevin documents obtained from the Canadian forces by the CBC. Yes, and it would appear that Canada is, is behind he worries about the long-term impact. I think you'll be finding many vo more veterans coming forward with legitimate claims against their government. Soldiers have been concerned about mefloquine for years. In 2003, Kevin Berry was a 19-year-old infantryman in Afghanistan. My section commander had been in Somalia and Rwanda. You know, he said, get ready to go loopy, boys. Barry and others began to experience anxiety, aggression, and vivid nightmares. He stopped taking it, but didn't dare tell his superiors. They made it abundantly clear that we would be charged if we weren't taking it. Donald Hookie wishes he'd stopped, like some of the men in his unit. Maybe I should have been one of those guys, huh? <laughs> we asked the Canadian forces for an interview about their policy on mefloquin. They turned us down. Nancy Wood, CBC News, Montreal. Okay, 
so that, that gives you uh, an introduction to um, recent media on this. Let's get back to the presentation. The, the, the paper that was referenced there was a case report that I published towards the end of my uh, military career. And what made this case very useful for advancing this issue is here we had uh, an individual that was suffering all of the symptoms of methylamine intoxication, but also had objective evidence of, of brainstem injury. He had central vestibulopathy, or, or measurable damage to the vestibular ocular uh, nuclei. And, and so it was, it was more difficult to dismiss his mental health symptoms, because here was a very unusual neurological finding. We didn't have any other explanations. It made quite a bit of, uh, of press. Um, and here's, here's what's interesting. I, I mentioned these personality changes, people just not feeling quite well. This is what family members notice. And, and you can see how easily it would be to dismiss these concerns, even though they were very real in the eyes of, of uh, the injured here. Uh, and it was really only after we found this objective evidence of, of brainstem injury that his case was taken seriously and charges of malingering against the individual that were being considered were, were finally dismissed. Well, what's very interesting is that the neurotoxicity that we now appreciate is caused by methylamine is actually a class effect that's been known about for decades. And I consider this a, a great tragedy that this historical information seems to have been missed during methylamine's development. We go back 70 years and we find evidence that related quinoline or quinoline, quinoline compounds um, exhibit the same tendency to damage uh, sections of the limbic system and uh, brainstem. Here you see um, uh, a slide that was taken during careful animal testing and some of the, the symptoms reported here are, are fairly profound. Uh, there's a whole number of papers that I've been able to track down describing this neurotoxic a syndrome that's often preceded by symptoms of intoxication. Here, here's a, a Dr. Schmidt who describes striking symptoms of central nervous system injury associated with lesions in the vestibulo-ocular nuclei. So again, the same effect seen with methylamine in earlier quinoline compounds. Their capacity to evoke reactions, mental health symptoms, which might mask symptoms of low-grade neuronal injury, uh, make a detailed search for central nervous system lesions highly desirable. And yet, tragically, when methylamine was being developed in the second U.S. military-sponsored drug development effort, the first was after World War II, the second was in the 60s and 70s, as I described, there doesn't seem to have been as careful a search for these brainstem lesions, even though we had plenty of evidence that this effect was, was common to these new drugs. Here's a, um, a drug closely related to methylamine that was being published on. Uh, lightheadedness, difficulties in focusing, headache and nausea, all should be considered symptoms of, bra of brainstem injury. And what's, what's truly fascinating is that this is Dr. Schmidt, the same individual that decades earlier had said you have to be very careful with this class of, of drugs. The first human trial of mefloquine exhibited more evidence again. They, they experienced a transient a dizziness and nausea, which we now recognize are central uh, brainstem-mediated symptoms. So a lot of unfortunate uh, missed opportunities to recognize uh, danger signals. But there's, even in recent memory, we've, we've missed this opportunity. If you look at the product insert, it says these prodromal symptoms are indications that the drug must be stopped, right? It's, it's, they're a warning sign of impending toxicity. But even this has been confused. In, in the early 2000s, the product insert was updated to say, well, if you have mental health uh, diagnoses or problems, you shouldn't take the drug. And this was misperceived by some as, as if to mean that only those individuals are susceptible to toxicity. But really what it means is individuals with a mental health history or that might be taking psychotropic medication, they're less likely to attribute those symptoms to the effects of the drug and more likely to attribute them to their pre-existing illness. And so they'll be less likely to discontinue taking the drug, risking the drug's accumulation beyond the neurotoxic threshold. So this explains the weak epidemiological association. But again, the lead has been buried. The reason you don't give this drug to people with a history of depression is because they'll miss the prodromal symptoms of intoxication that herald impending neurotoxicity. Now, when I was in the Army, I did a, a, I thought this was very interesting, the, the fact that there are these contra contraindications, and I knew that the U.S. military was having more and more mental illness within its ranks, and so I was curious to know just how many people within the U.S. military that could have potentially been exposed to methylamine had a contraindication. So I had access to large um, public health surveillance databases, and I, I did this study among individuals that had actually deployed to Afghanistan, so there's some suggestion that they're healthier than uh, normal. And, and, and what we found was that roughly 10% of this cohort 
of soldiers deployed to Afghanistan with, with automatic weapons had some documented contraindication to the use of mefloquine, either a prescription of a drug that would be um, consistent with treatment of a mental disorder or a, a diagnosed condition in one of these ICD-9 uh, codes. Here are the uh, drugs that I searched for, and virtually all of these drugs had been prescribed to one or more soldiers who had deployed to uh, Afghanistan. And here's the result of, of the study. We see a, a very high number of, even independent of, of mefloquine, we see a very large number of soldiers being deployed on psychotropic medications and with a history of diagnosed mental health uh, disorders. And females have much higher uh, prevalence of contraindications than men. So a 10% prevalence of contraindications is, is pretty significant, and it warrants care and careful screening uh, before um, distributing the drug. Uh, so this, this paper was not well received by uh, the military, and I found myself in Africa uh, a few years later, but uh, I had time on my hands, and so I was able to publish the follow-up study, uh, which was, okay, of those with contraindications, how many were actually prescribed the methylene? And, and the results are, are, are rather shocking. So here I broke it down by the type of medication they had received, ADHD treatments, uh, antipsychotic drugs. Yes, there were 20 individuals in, in Afghanistan in 2007 uh, that were on an antipsychotic drug. And you can see that the, the percentage of those that were prescribed uh, methylene. So, so pretty frightening stuff, all things considered. And, and I, I concluded in my paper that the possibility of unrecognized harm from this practice was significant and that further research uh, needed to be done. So now I find myself here. So my research interests are really in continuing um, this work. Uh, I'm interested in, in a lot of genetic studies related to susceptibility to the syndrome. And of course, if you're going to do genetic studies in mental health, you need to carefully define the phenotype. So I'm, I'm very interested in pinning down precisely the, what this syndrome is, and coming up with, with a fairly sensitive and specific case definition. And we can use that using the FDA adverse event reports. We can use uh, case series and individual case reports. And we can also look to historical case reports from other uh, quinoline or quinoline compounds, quinine, chloroquine, for example. And we see a preserved syndrome across these uh, drugs. The genetic epidemiology is fascinating because this, this intoxication syndrome is, is idiosyncratic. I can give this drug to everyone in the room and most of you will experience some psychotropic symptoms, but they'll, they'll tend to be mild and they'll resolve, or you'll, you'll think they'll resolve over time. But some of you may experience very profound symptoms, including psychosis. And in a, a group this size, probably one of you will experience uh, hallucinations or delusions or, or, um, or worse. So it's idiosyncratic, and understanding the genetic epidemiology of this idiosyncrasy is, is, is I think, uh, key. All evidence points to, to simple pharmacokinetics. If the drug accumulates at high levels in brain, this predicts uh, susceptibility. And since efflux of the drug is mediated by a well-studied transporter pump, polymorphisms in this uh, pump are probably the best candidate to go looking for, for an explanation. And then further understanding the pharmacodynamics. What exactly is this drug doing? How is it exerting its toxic effects? Uh, there's been a lot in the literature, in the neuroscience literature, on gap junction blockade. And it's very likely this drug exerts excitotoxicity, which is very similar to the quinolytic acid excitotoxicity that's seen in cases of cerebral malaria. So it's very interesting that individuals who are suffering from the worst form of this disease and who are given this drug may have the symptoms caused by the drug confused for the symptoms of the disease that the drug was used to treat. It makes teasing out what is due to the drug and what is due to the disease a little more difficult, but not impossible. And then because I suspect this, this syndrome is, is quite prevalent, I'm interested in quantifying well, just how much morbidity and mortality is there due to, to this uh, intoxication. Uh, and that includes suicide, and then something else that I've become interested in since, since studying here, as a potential underrecognized source of morbidity in, in conflict zones and among refugees where this drug might be given. And then of course, as a doctor public health student, I'm very interested in translating the results of research into uh, policy decisions, uh, including changes to the drug labeling and regulatory and, um, and um, practice uh, recommendations. I recently was invited to, to meet with uh, FDA working group who's investigating this neurotoxicity, and I made some, some quick recommendations, and I'll, I'll wrap up with this. Um, if you read the label, it says, if you experience these prodromal symptoms, you must stop taking the drug. And a few lines down, it says, this drug may be safely given to infants and children. Well, you can see this doesn't make sense, right? Because if, if an infant is experiencing prodromal symptoms, 
anxiety, depression, restlessness, confusion, they can't verbalize they're experiencing those symptoms. And, and since you must stop taking the drug if you experience these symptoms, how can an infant safely take this medication? So I, I hope they reconsider the indication uh, for pediatric use. It, it, it just is not logical. You can't have both on the same level. And then I want them to clarify the mental health contraindications. For too long, uh, there's been a stigma associated with, with mental illness with this drug, as, as though your history of depression somehow molecularly predisposes you to toxicity from the drug. That's not true. They have to clarify that having that history simply confounds recognition of a true biologically based program. And then it's also important to understand that, that the whole safety strategy for the use of this drug is in the individual recognizing that they're experiencing prodromal symptoms and then that individual stopping the drug. But this is, this is equivalent, if you will, to telling an individual after you've been drinking, make a reasoned decision whether you can safely drive home. And if you decide that you're too drunk to drive home, then call a cab. And, and we know this doesn't work, right? It, an individual who's suffering the prodromal symptoms of intoxication will, by definition, have some of their decision-making capability affected. And, and so individuals who take this drug need to understand that, that this strategy, it will eliminate some of the morbidity, some of the mortality, but not all, right? And then lastly, this, this euphemism, this a more serious event, euphemisms have no place in FDA-approved product inserts. You know, what, what is a more serious event? Is it suicide? Is it psychosis? Is it impulsive acts of violence? The drug company knows. The FDA should know. So this should be explicitly stated uh, in the product insert. And then lastly, uh, I think the product insert should include a reference to the, the blood-brain barrier penetration of the drug and the drug's association with, with neurotoxicity. It doesn't need to be taken off the market, but if individuals know the dangers associated with the drug, then they and their doctor can make an informed decision about whether to use it. And, and some people will continue using it despite these uh, dangers, but I think most people will say, this drug is, is not for me. So I think I'm, I'm out of time. Let me wrap up. I'll talk about my genetic study uh, some other day. I'm happy to take, uh, take a few questions.